Okay. So here is the title of my thesis, Sentiment Mapping, Point Pattern Analysis of Sentiment Classified Twitter Data. And first, I'd like to start by thanking you all very much for coming out and joining me this morning. Um, a couple issues of housekeeping, as Rachel said, please have your audio muted. I also ask that if you have a video running, you turn off your video, at least during the time of the presentation so that it doesn't create any issues with lag and that there aren't any interruptions. I also recommend that you view this presentation in the full screen mode so that, so that you can see all of my tables and figures fully because I am using a fairly large screen here at home and so it might not show up well on smaller screens if it's not full screen. Um, you can double click on my screen share to either enlarge it and make it full screen or to make it smaller. And with that, let's begin. So I'm gonna start off by um, actually at the end of my research a bit by showing you some of the results just so that you start my presentation understanding exactly what I mean by sentiment mapping. So the maps shown here it show people's opinions expressed on Twitter toward natural gas. On the left, you can see spatially locations of positive sentiment. And on the right, you can see spatially where there were clusters of negative sentiment toward natural gas. And these two maps were made using techniques from point pattern analysis, which comes from geography and is used to analyze the distribution of points, such as tw tweets in space, and sentiment analysis, which is, comes from the computer science field of natural language processing and is used to analyze and categorize text. My goal for this presentation is to have you understand why I bothered to do this, how I did it, and what some of the applications and uses of these results might be. I'll begin with by discussing this paper from Michael Goodchild. It's a 2000 paper, 2007 paper titled Citizens as Sensors. And in this paper, he's discussing this growing new world of volunteer geographic information system, which is data that's not collected by individual researchers, but data that's freely submitted by individuals. And the geographic component indicates that these data are tied to a point somewhere. And in his analysis, he identifies three different types of sensors that exist in geographic research. One is a standalone mechanical sensor, such as a weather station, or a seismograph, which sits passively and collects data. A second type of sensor is one that's attached to humans. So you can think of maybe someone driving around with a GPS unit, collecting data as they're moving. And then there's this third type of sensor, which he describes very poetically, so I'll quote him here. A third type of sensor network, and in many ways the most interesting, consists of humans themselves, each equipped with some working subset of the five senses and with the intelligence to compile and interpret what they sense, and each free to rove the surface of the planet. This network of human sensors has over six billion components, each an intelligent synthesizer and interpreter of local information. So what he's saying is that humans take in information all the time about their environment, and they also report on that information. But instead of giving a data log, like a weather station or a seismograph might give, they report on that information, so information socially. And what the internet is allowing us to do is tap into some of those social interactions that are occurring on social networks such as Twitter. So my thesis takes this idea of humans as sensors and runs with it. It says, let's take a geographic approach to this social network information and see what the sensors are actually measuring, both in space and time. So humans are sensors that measure all kinds of things about themselves and their environment. They have psychological states, they have different social dynamics, they spread ideas and language across networks, people move across space and time, and they bring opinions and ideas with them. But importantly, all of these networks can be placed in space on a map. There is a wide breadth of geographic information available on people that's currently floating out in cyberspace on social networks that's just waiting to be explored and researched. My study concerns itself with natural gas sentiment because personally I'm interested in environmental issues such as energy production. And interestingly with environmental issues, the perspectives we hold toward them influences what actually happens. So with natural gas, your opinions toward natural gas might determine what you use to heat your home. 
That said, though I'm focusing on natural gas, the methods I'm showing you here can be applied to just about any research subject. And of course, the more spatial the subject, the more interesting it will be for geographic research. Now there is one caveat, and you may know this, Twitter is not real life. Twitter users are, on average, higher income, younger, and more highly educated than an average American. They're also 60% Democrat and 35% Republican. And further, 10% of users are responsible for 80% of all the tweets posted. And two thirds of this 10% are female, and they're highly political, posting about four times as many political tweets as other users. So just note as I'm going through my results here that I'm not using an unbiased sample of people living in the United States. I'm using a biased sample that comes from a single social media network. So interpret my results with due caution as we go through. I think I'll be remiss not to mention that. So I'm gonna give a couple examples now of two studies that come from the literature that show just a little taste of what's been done um, in regards to social media analysis. This first paper is hashtag earthquake, which used geotagged tweets. And geotagged tweets are posts that people make on Twitter that also um, include the latitude and longitude that they're posting from. And these were geotagged posts that contained the hashtag earthquake. And the authors were doing spatial analysis of how those tweets spread out from the epicenter of the earthquake. And they looked at different time slices and they compared the spread of those tweets out from the earthquake to the actual um, ring of the tremors of the earthquake. And so in a very tangible way, the study demonstrates the idea of humans as sensors. In this case, humans were acting something like seismographs. In terms of sentiment analysis, I'll share this paper called uh, EmpaTweet. It's, it's a 2012 study that was looking at and tracking different emotions on Twitter over time and with relation to certain events. So these authors were tracking seven different emotions and they would use sentiment analysis to ascribe an emotion to each tweet based on the text it was containing. And these results here are emotions that were expressed in response to the 2012 election. And you can see overwhelmingly the main emotion just expressed was disgust, second most common emotion was anger, and very little positive emotion was seen. So studies such as this one can be used to explore how people feel about different situation, or at least how people on Twitter are expressing their emotions. Now, there are some studies that have a combination of spatial analysis and sentiment analysis, but none of them quite get it right, and there's really no standardized method. A lot of these studies are kind of disjointed from one another. So it was my goal with the research, with, with my research, to propose a type of methods that could be applied to a broad range of Twitter data that could analyze both the sentiment, analyze the sentiment um, both on its own and also geographically. And so for the majority of this presentation now, I'm going to take you through my sentiment mapping process. And if this was a research paper, this section would be a combination of both the methods and the results. So I'll be discussing what I did and what results came out as I went along. And a the theme of this section you'll see is that there's a mix of automated processes with manual validation and correction. So I'll come back to this figure a few times as I go through my presentation. And my methods are divided into these four different sections, which are bolded here. First, I'll be speaking about the data collection. Then I'll be talking about the location analysis and the sentiment analysis. And then I'll be discussing the spatial analysis, which combines the location and the sentiment. And you can see the general trend of the methods is that I'm taking data from Twitter, running these different analyses on it, and then outputting a map of the sentiments overall. And so I'll start by talking about data collection where I interacted with the Twitter API, which allows you to both interact with the website, like you can make a post for example, but you can also download data from Twitter. And that was my use of the Twitter API. So for data collection, I worked in our software using the package rtweet, and I collect, collected data weekly from May 2019 to the end of January 2020. And each time I would download tweets, I would look at different forms of energy production and search these different key terms, and then I would pour over the results and see what was returned. So in each case, 
I would convert the results into a CSV file, and I would look over the tweets one by one to get an idea of what was being returned. And I refined my research to the topic of natural gas for a few reasons. Firstly, most of these tweets were actually relevant to natural gas. You can imagine tweets about nuclear, tweets containing the terms nuclear would also have a lot of other discussion, um, such as about nuclear war or other conflicts that are occurring. Biomass might have more environmental focused discussion, not necessarily talking about energy production. And so it's important to make sure the tweets are relevant to the topic you're interested in. And I also chose natural gas because there appeared to be a similar amount of positive and negative sentiment expressed overall, which is good for an analysis because I was interested in both sides, both the positive and the negative sentiment. So in many ways, the data that's collected determines the type of research questions you can ask and the scope of the subject. Now, in total, I collected 366,000 tweets, and this data has a lot of information. In total, there are 88 different fields, although I only used seven of them for these methods. The first is a language, to, language field, which I used to restrict the set of tweets to the English language. There was a created at field, which I used to analyze when the tweets were posted. I used the screen name as sort of some data quality checks, make sure I wasn't dealing with bots or people repeating the same tweet over and over again. The text, of course, is the actual content of the tweet, which I used for the sentiment analysis to decide whether tweets were positive or negative or neutral toward natural gas. And then these three final fields were used in the location analysis, which I will talk about in this next section of the methods. So here now we have our tweet data collected and we're moving on to the location analysis, which interacts with a geocoding API. Geocoding is the conversion of text string like just words, a location, into latitude and longitude coordinates. And there are all sorts of different services out there. Personally, I used a service called Geocodio. And to Geocodio, I would pass whatever the location was in the um, user's, the, the Twitter user's profile. And so, for example, if the location was Lansing, it would return Lansing, Michigan, and then an area code with an accompanying, accompanying latitude and longitude coordinates. That said, a lot of people don't actually put where they're from in their location field. So one user put witness protection and that returned protection Kansas and the latitude and longitude of protection Kansas. Someone else put over the rainbow and there is a place in, there's a uh, town or city in California called rainbow. And so a lot of time was used to clean up the results and analyze them, looking for outliers, things that didn't make sense, mismatches. And by the end of the process, I ended up with about 100,000 total tweets that had an accuracy score of one, meaning I was very confident, the geocoder I used was very confident that these results were actually, the, that these tweets were being assigned at the locations that they were actually posting from. The majority of these were place level, so they were either cities or zip codes or other fairly small areas. Many were also at the state level. I chose not to use those tweets for this analysis. And then 3,700 tweets were coordinates. And these are the tweets that were obtained directly from geotagged tweets. And so many studies restrict themselves to using geotagged tweets only. But you can see here, I would only have 4% of my total data set compared to using the full range of location data available. And then these other fields are also returned from the geocoder. They're just at more accurate levels than the place level. Okay, so at this point in the research, we have our tweets collected. For each tweet, we've ascribed a latitude and longitude to it. And so now we can move on to the sentiment analysis and figure out what these tweets actually are saying about natural gas. And the goal of sentiment analysis is to classify the tweets into three different categories positive, neutral, and negative. And this is done in two steps. First, there is manual classification of the tweets. And this is done to create some training data that is then used to uh, program and parameterize machine learning algorithms that then automate the process for the rest of the tweets because I'm not able to um, ascribe a sentiment to 100,000 tweets myself. So first, there was a manual classification. 
So I poured over 5,000 different tweets. And for each one, I would read the tweet. I would ask of it whether or not it shows a preference for the continued use or expansion of natural gas as an energy source. And then based on the tweet sentiment toward that question, I would give it either a positive, a negative, or a neutral score. And so I poured over 5,000 tweets. And I'd also like to thank Piero here, who is listening, who looked over some tweets himself as kind of a second reviewer to validate some of my results. In total, from the manually coded subset, um, you can look at this waffle plot here to see the proportions of neutral tweets to the positive and negative categories. And you can see that overwhelmingly, the tweets were neutral, meaning either they didn't express positive or negative sentiment strongly, or that their tweet was just irrelevant and not really connected um, to the issue at all. There was also slightly more negative tweets than positive tweets, although the ratio isn't that bad. It's, it's a fairly even split here with the manually coded subset. So once the manually coded subset was finished, it could be used as training data for these different types of machine learning classifications. And I chose to use more than one classifier here. Um, and I'll use the analogy of a crime to explain why. If a crime occurs and you're trying to figure out what's going on, you don't have perfect information and there's no way to actually recreate what happened. So you wanna collect as many witnesses as possible. And you can see what the witnesses agree on and have some confidence that, that those events occurred, but where the witnesses disagree with one another, you're going to have less confidence. And so in this case, I don't actually know what the, what, I don't actually have a way to validate the final classification of 100,000 tweets. But if there's strong agreement between many of the classifiers and they're telling a similar story, I might be able to have more confidence. I use three different families of classifiers, naive Bayes, support vector machine, and log logistic regression. And I'm not going to get into the um, details of what's what or try to explain how these work at this time, but you can ask about that more in the questions if you're interested in. And for each classifier, this was done post hoc, I ascribed some kind of personality to each one, just so that you can have an idea of which one is which as I go through the presentation. The naive Bayes classifiers, I made them the three stooges and I chose each stooge carefully. For support vector machine, I used three musketeers minus D'Artagnan. And for logistic regression or max cent, maximum entropy, I used the Lone Ranger to represent that, that classifier. But there's one other classifier that I used as well. And this was an ensemble classifier that was created by having the other families of classifier put their, put their votes for it on each tweet. And then I would take all their votes together and assign the most common rating for each tweet to the ensemble classifier. So in some ways, this was supposed to be representative of all of them combined. And the personality I assigned for the ensemble classifier was the fairest of all daytime television personalities, Judge Judy. And now we'll get into the results of um, some of these results of the performance of the classifiers on the subset of the 5,000 tweets. And I know this is a lot of numbers, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. I just want to point out a few things about the results here. So the first thing I want to point out is that I'm breaking down the performance of the classifiers into positive, negative, and neutral categories. It's really important to look beyond the overall accuracy score when you're doing sentiment analysis that, that covers more than one category because the accuracy score overall hides a lot of details of how each category individually is performing. And so for the overall accuracy, I will note that the naive Bayes classifiers had the lowest scores overall with the top, uh, with the lowest score being the Gaussian naive Bayes classifier, which I just couldn't get to work right with this data set. And it gave it the highest accuracy, the highest accuracy score it could give was about 23%. If you look at the precision for the different classifiers, you get an idea of how accurate they were within individual categories. And so again, you can see the naive Bayes classifiers had the lowest accuracy within categories and the accuracy scores in the other categories was somewhere around 80% on average, which is pretty good. The recall tells you how many of the positive or negative tweets it actually found. And so if there's a thousand positive tweets in the data set, 
and it finds 500, you get a, you get a recall here of 50%. So in general, the positive and negative tweets had recall of around 50%, although uh, the classifiers had an easier time finding the negative tweets than they did the positive tweets. Um, positive tweet recall was around uh, 40% for most classifiers. And then finally, all of the classifiers, except for the, the first classifier, performed very well with the neutral tweets. And that's because by assigning as many tweets as possible to the neutral category, it made less errors in positive and negative tweets, which is what I wanted the classifiers to do. I would much rather have the machine learning classifiers call too many tweets negative, or assign too many tweets the neutral category then assign too many either the positive or the negative category, because that's what's actually given us the sentiment maps. And one final way to break down the sentiment analysis performance is to look at the proportion of positive, negative, and neutral tweets that were assigned overall over the full data set. Again, this was the manually coded subset results here. And these waffle plots, each square represents 2,000 tweets. And Bearing in mind the low recall that we saw, we would expect that less positive and negative tweets will be found overall in the full data set compared to the manually coded uh, subset, the training data. And note here that there are similar results within, oops, sorry about that. Note here that there are similar results within the family of SVM classifiers. The Maxent and Ensemble classifier had similar proportions, but the Naive Bayes classifiers really had no, co no cohesion. Uh, the Gaussian naive Bayes classifier, which we know to be uh, the least accurate, had wildly different proportions. The multinomial naive Bayes had very, very few positive tweets it found. So these classifiers, at this point, and this stage in the analysis, I'm thinking that these classifiers are much going to be much less accurate and actually representative of the data. And so now, at this point, we have our data. We have a location, a latitude and longitude for each tweet and we have some kind of sentiment score for each tweet. And so we're ready to move on to the final stage of the methods, which is the sentiment analysis or spatial analysis. And this is where we actually start to create and look at some different ways of mapping the sentiment. The first spatial analysis technique I'll talk about is something called kernel density mapping. Um, to demonstrate how that works, um, I'm showing you a map here of all the tweets in the data set. And you can see that they're clustering in places that make sense, a lot of them in the east, especially the northeast, and then some other high population areas on the west coast. And this is turned into a kernel density map, which shows you the density of tweets in each pixel in each area. You get a very similar picture, but some important things stand out. So one of those is Washington DC here, which has the highest density of tweets in the entire country. Now that makes sense given that this is a political topic, but looking at the distribution of points alone, you don't really get that feel. So the kernel density map allows us to see some different trends. Another area that it highlights is Western Pennsylvania. And this area actually makes a lot of sense because Western Pennsylvania is home to the most natural gas production anywhere in the United States. And so we're able to look at the kernel density map to learn some things about the distribution of the tweets in space. But of course, we're interested in more than that. We're also interested in looking at how the sentiment is distributed in space. And so the first way I looked at the sentiment was a technique from point pattern analysis called the spatial scan statistic. And this statistic is used to locate clusters of points relative to a background rate of other points. And so I'm going to give a quick example here. Imagine in this box, we're looking at a map of different points in space somewhere. And these points are the background rate of neutral tweets. And you can see there's far more neutral tweets on the eastern half than the western half. Now, if I were to find a lot of positive sentiment in this area, it wouldn't be very surprising because we already know there are a lot of tweets happening there anyway because of the rate of neutral tweets. However, if a lot of positive tweets were found in this region of the map, that would, that would be a much more significant cluster to us because there's a much lower background rate of tweeting that's happening there. So the spatial scan statistic gives us a way of quantifying the statistical significance of finding different clusters in different locations when compared to some kind of background rate. And now I'll show you the results of these spatial scan statistics 
over all the classifiers for positive and negative tweaks. Now, I know this is a lot of maps. Don't be afraid. I'll walk through it slowly. And I'm not expecting you to totally take in everything. I'm just trying to give you a broad overview of the results. So in the upper left, we have the SVM classifiers, the three musketeers. In the upper right, we have our naive Bayes classifiers. And then we have the Lone Ranger and Judge Judy at the bottom. We'll start here in the upper left with this SVM classifier, just noting the differences between the positive sentiment map, which is on the left, and the negative sentiment map, which is on the right. Now, the darker any of these circles are indicates that there was more significance in the clustering. And the first thing you can note is that there are more clusters and they're more distributed in the map of positive sentiment than then in the map of negative sentiment. For the negative sentiment, we see that they're clustered around Seattle, Washington, the Bay Area, and various different areas in the Northeast. Whereas if we look at the positive sentiment, there are many more clusters and they're a little bit more distributed. And then similar trends hold true for the other SVM classifiers. We see very similar clusters of negative sentiment, although the positive sentiment clusters show a little bit more variation. The same story is being told that they're, that they're more widely distributed than the negative sentiment. And these patterns hold fairly true for the Maxent classifier at the bottom left and the Ensemble classifier in the bottom right as well. The main deviations we see are in the Naive Bayes classifiers, the most different of which is the Gaussian Naive Bayes, where these results don't match any of the other maps very well at all. In the multinomial naive bays, you don't really get any strong Bay Area cluster. And so, again, this is reaffirming my understanding that the naive Bayes classifiers aren't doing a very good job of classifying these results. And I'm taking a little bit less stock in these results. If they were all telling one kind of cogent story, then we could take them a little bit more seriously. But because they're so different from one another, it's, it's hard to have faith in what any individual, any one of these three classifiers is saying. So overall, we find that positive sentiment clusters, clusters are more dispersed around the United States and that the negative sentiment clusters are found in population centers uh, that are along the coast. A second type of map I used draws back on this idea of kernel density that I showed in the first example when we were looking at all of the tweets. In this case, we're taking the difference between two kernel density maps. So the first map, we're looking at the positive sentiment and where that is most and least dense. In the second map, we're looking at the negative sentiment. And this is using just the raw count values of those tweets. And if we subtract the negative sentiment from the positive sentiment, we can create a map that visualizes in green where there are more negative tweets than positive tweets and in orange where there are more positive tweets than negative tweets. And I'm not showing every classifier anymore. I'm just going to show one classifier from each family. So the naive Bayes classifier in the bottom left continues to agree least strongly with the results of the other classifiers. Although for the negative sentiment, the green, it is still fairly agreeable with the other classifiers. The SVM, Maxent, and Ensemble classifiers agree with one another very strongly on areas where there is a lot of positive or a lot of negative sentiment. We see negative sentiment we see negative sentiment the most dense in Western Pennsylvania, again, where there's a lot of natural gas production occurring, and also in Texas. And across three of the maps here, those are the strongest, these, those are the most dense areas of positive natural gas sentiment. Interestingly, Texas is the second largest producer of natural gas in the country. So we have the two states producing the largest amount of natural gas, also showing the highest proportion of positive sentiment toward natural gas. And then for negative sentiment, we see similar results from before, from before. So a conclusion from these maps is that positive sentiment is aligning with natural gas producing areas and that negative sentiment is lining with these more uh, urban cities. And now these results may not be surprising or give you much new information if you understand maybe the political climate of the United States or where natural gas is produced but remember where we got this data from. This was freely accessible Twitter data. This was just people saying their opinions on a social media platform. And we're getting results that are
fairly strongly re reflecting what we might expect given our understanding of the real world and what's on the ground. Now, one flaw of these maps is that areas of lower population don't give a lot of information because there aren't a lot of negative or positive tweets overall. We don't see a very high raw value in either, in either direction. And so a solution for that is to take the square root of the positive sentiment and subtract from that the square root of the negative sentiment in order to really make the areas of lower population pop out. Now there is a cost to doing this. These maps are going to be the least reliable because we're highlighting the areas that have the least data. But they're also some of the more interesting to look at because you can look at a sub-state level where there is more areas where there are more positive and negative sentiment. Again, naive Bayes is the outlier here showing much less positive sentiment overall. And I'm not going to go over all the clusters, but I will come back to this during the question time so you can look at it a little bit further. But if you look at any individual state across the CSVM, Maxent, or Ensemble classifier, you see very similar patterns. So take Michigan, for example, you see the strongest negative sentiment in the Southeast and sentiment becoming more positive as you move in the North and West direction. And this holds true for all of the classifiers, um, even naive phase. And for most states in the United States, that type of pattern holds true. I'm not going to go into the time series results in any depth. I just want to point out that I also looked a little bit into the frequency of positive, negative, and neutral sentiment over time. In doing so, you can see when different, uh, when positive or negative sentiment had different spikes, which you can relate to different news events or different real world occurrences. But also note that there's a lot of variation in the overall frequency of tweets, tweets in natural gas and also within categories. More interesting, I think, is to look at how the sentiment changes over time, not just in terms of density, but in terms of spatial density. And so um, here the sentiment is plotted out month by month, which is a fun way to visualize the data. And here I'm using the ensemble classifier. And what really stands out looking at the tweets over time is the enormous variation that occurs on a month by month basis. And so if I were to have had, had I were to draw data from any of these months individually, my final results would look very different. So I think this really points out that it's key to analyze long-term trends in Twitter data if you want to have some kind of cogent results. And my study was eight months. I would recommend six months or up to a year um, if you want to analyze more of the long-term sentiment rather than some of these spikes that pop up in different locations over time. And those were the three types of sentiment maps I made. And so now I'll just briefly discuss some of the conclusions and contributions that these methods have to contribute to geography and other social sciences. So first, my thesis builds upon and expands the idea of humans as sensors. sensors. And it really shows the power of this idea using data that is very accessible to anyone. It's, this is freely accessible data. And I provided method, methods for three different sentiment mapping techniques. Those were the raw sentiment map, the exaggerated sentiment map, and the sentiment cluster maps. And the machine learning classifiers, they agreed with, with each other fairly strongly. They were witnesses that were telling a similar story, enough so that I had confidence in the results, at least that they were representing the Twitter data that I had. And these results also made some real world, real world sense. There's lots of room for these techniques to grow. There are many future applic applications in the areas of social sciences, such as opinion research, of course, geography, psychology, and sociology might be interested in mood, um, people interested in media and news or different issues like environmental issues might also have interest in seeing how sentiments are distributed spatially. It could also be profitable if advertisers want to know uh, where people have positive and negative views of their product or where people think favorably versus unfavorably about different topics. And of course, there's also lots of room for improvement. Twitter and other social media sites are growing and they're having an increasingly large impact on the world. And part of analyzing that impact is analyzing also not just the tweets individually, but 
analyzing tweets in terms of their influence. So looking at the number of retweets they have or the number of likes and maybe weighting the spatial analysis based on those factors. Other point pattern techniques could be used. Um, I was only drawing from the literature um, in a small amount. There are many other techniques out there. More could be done to quantify the uncertainty and the likelihood of finding the spatial results that I found. And I also want to note that these methods are only really exploratory. So what I've created so far cannot be used for hypothesis testing really. So it would be interesting to see if these methods could be adopted in a way for people to make some kind of postulation and then test that idea and quantify it with some more statistics. And so I think these methods have a lot to contribute to the field, but importantly, there's also a lot of room to grow. But mainly I wanted to put out in the world some kind of set of standard methods that people could take and apply to their data. I wanted these methods to be understandable and usable and applicable to a wide range of different topics. And hopefully you feel I accomplished that with my work. In conclusion, I would like to acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Rachel Bortelli, um, in the geography department. I could not have done this without her. And my other committee members as well, Dr. Bruno Takahashi, who does work in environmental journalism and communication, and Dr. Ashton Shortridge, who's also in the geography department, whose both of their curiosity and ideas and encouragement um, really made this project into what it was. And of course, I would be remiss not to mention uh, my friend Piero, who helped me look over the results and validate them. And he is a member, along with my other friends of the Lunch Buddies. And I'd like to thank them for their camaraderie throughout the semester and navigating our way through graduate school together. And with that, I conclude my presentation. I will return to my exaggerated sentiment maps to give you some more time to mull those over while you think of any questions you might have. So let me know if anything was unclear, if I lost you any, anywhere, if there's any specific area you'd like to hear more about, and feel free to use either the chat function or the microphone at this time to um, let me hear your thoughts and what your questions may be. So thank you very much for listening.